evening, everybody. Welcome to the Cleveland Heights University Heights School Board meeting for Tuesday, October 5th, 2021. Mr. Gaynor, would you please call the roll? Ms. Wright. Here. Mr. Posh. Here. Mr. Hines. Here. Ms. Serini. Here. Ms. Lewis. Here. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with awards and recognitions. Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for joining us tonight. First, our National Gear Up Student of the Year. I'd like to begin our recognitions by celebrating an outstanding Heights High student. This student's name has made district headlines quite a few times for her efforts in social activism, entrepreneurship, student leadership, and today, academic achievement. Taylor Evans was named by the National Council for Community and Education Partnerships as the Gear Up Student of the Year. This award is given to one student in the United States who embodies the Gear Up mission to excel, prove, and mobilize. Taylor serves as the lead intern and ambassador for Gear Up to New Heights. The Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergraduate Programs initiative focuses on increasing the college and career readiness of low-income students in communities nationwide. To put this in perspective, just how big of an award this is, Gear Up serves a half of a million students across 46 states. I want to personally thank Taylor, who is also a member of the superintendent's cadre, for consistently being an excellent representation of our district, leading by example for fellow students, and her fierce advocacy for what's best for all students in our district. As a superintendent, I've learned a lot from Taylor, and she always has a great, insightful perspective on the district and things that are happening on behalf of students. We're so lucky to have Taylor as a member of the Cleveland Heights University Heights community. Taylor, please come up and receive your award and take a photo. to acknowledge School Custodian Appreciation Day, which happened during the month of September. In honor of National School Custodian Appreciation Day that was this past Saturday, I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our school's custodians. You all play a major role in keeping our schools going, making sure that our buildings are up to standards and functioning properly so that our students and staff can face each day in an environment that is safe, comfortable, and without distraction. We give immense gratitude, gratitude to each and every one of our school custodians for the love and care that they put into our schools. We truly, truly appreciate you. So we are honoring today Miles Arnold, Freddie Crawford, Tony Dean, Jason Franklin, Richard Gazan, Aaron Green, Carrie Jackson, Deontay Jackson, Greg Jacob, Tony Jeffrey, Michael Lauer, Jarius McCorder, David Moss, Paul Petkak, William Porter, Jonathan Ross, Torian Slaughter, Ed Stair, Norman Strickland, Keith Walker, and Kirk White. Are any of those individuals here this evening? Please come on. Up.
How you doing, Carrie? September, we celebrated our Information Technology Department on National IT Professional Day. Our IT department is truly amazing. They have guided us through some of our greatest obstacles these past years as we began offering online and hybrid learning models to families and staff. There have been no tasks too big or too small for them as they have made great things happen for us. Now remember about 18 months ago when we first went virtual, how quickly the IT team jumped into action and quickly distributed out Chromebooks to students so that they could continue with their learning. They have provided our students with over 5,000 devices, all while supporting our daily technology needs. And they're even making the live stream of this meeting happen tonight. <laughs> so um, I would like to thank, and if you are here, um, please come up if you can. Dr. Christina Bauer, Brian Bailey, Mark Brown, Craig Carey, Nakia Cleveland, Jean Glassman, Jonathan Haslett, Jim Pofsek, and Fred Walker. Come on up if you guys can. <laughs> to our Tiger Team Members of the Month. We are excited to have the opportunity to recognize our Tiger Team members for the month of September. These Cleveland Heights University Heights staff members have been recognized by their peers and community for going above and beyond to continuously contribute to the culture of excellence in our district. Please know that you are so appreciated by your colleagues who have nominated you, and we appreciate your work and commitment to the district. We wanted to share, as we start our Tiger Team member uh, recognitions for this year, a bit of feedback from your colleagues who have nominated you. So the first person is Kelvin Robinson, who was nominated from the Board of Education. Kelvin Pierce say, Kelvin always politely and professionally responds to every request and makes it happen. He is one employee who really gets things done. From Boulevard Elementary, our nominee, our, our person we're recognizing is Carolyn Yu. Carol is always rolling up her sleeves to join the team to do whatever is necessary to help the students succeed. She is funny and an eternal optimist. And if you're here, I say your name. You can, you can, um, please come up, and we'll so we can recognize you. From Canterbury Elementary, Katie Merrick. Katie's creative perspective, flexibility, and attention to detail is an asset to all she works with. I am honored to work alongside her. Delisle Options Center, Jonathan Haslett. Jonathan works hard to clean, troubleshoot, and repair hundreds of our students' Chromebooks. We appreciate him. Fairfax Elementary School, Sonia Smith. Sonia is a dedicated, loving, hard worker who goes beyond her position. From Garrity, Delta Gray. Mrs. Gray comes early and stays late, making sure everyone has what they need to be successful. From Heights High School, Patrick Gleba. Patrick is very innovative in his position as an ASL teacher. In his position as a girls soccer coach, Patrick is the ultimate in sportsmanship, civility, and his passion is evident. From Monticello Middle School, Kay Milkey. Kay is such a generous person with her time. 
She is always willing to help anyone out, no matter how small or how large the need is, and make sure that everybody feels like a somebody. From Noble Elementary School, Gabriella Didona. Whether Gabriella is putting together resources for her scholars to use at home, or she is planning birthday surprises for the staff, Gabriella always goes above and beyond. We are so lucky to have her at Noble. From Oxford, Melissa Schwartz. Melissa makes every day a better day for her students and fellow staff members at Oxford. She is such a ray of sunshine in our building. From Roxborough Elementary School, Candace Summers. Candace helps every single one of us become better as teachers. I really enjoy working with her at examining my data and finding ways to help my students succeed and improve. And from Roxborough Middle School, Anissa Shapiro. Anisha is the team lead for special education and, and has supported new teachers. She tries her hardest to ensure students' needs are being met. Do we have any of these winners with us this evening? Well, let's congratulate them in their absence. This concludes tonight's recognitions, and I am now going to turn it over to 10th grader Deshara Turner and 11th grader Kenji Sakia for our student cadre report. So Liz, there is an issue with the sound on these. Mark, how are we going to handle the sound on these? So. Okay. My microphone is unmuted. Benji, go ahead. I believe Tashar is supposed to start to she say the introduction already. Good evening. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. The mic is muted. I couldn't hear anything. Um, good evening, Board of Education members, Superintendent Kirby and Mr. Gaynor. My name is Tashar and I'm a sophomore at Heights High. My name is Kendra Sakaya and I'm an 11th grader at Heights High. As members of the Superintendent's student cadre, we are here to give a brief report about what is happening at Heights High. We're honored to be here this evening. Thank you for the opportunity. First, we would like to share about our athletic teams and provide an update on several upcoming events at Heights High. Um, the Heights High football team is off to a 5-2 start, but remain undefeated in the Lake Erie League. The boys soccer team is off to a 5-5-1 start to the season. They are currently 1-0 in the Lake Erie League with games against Shaker and Lorraine remaining. The Lady Tigers for the girls soccer team is 4-6-1 to six to one and undefeated 3-9 in the Lake Erie League. The only remaining LEL game is senior night against Bedford. After a slow start to the season, the volleyball team has found their stride winning three of the last five matches. The girls tennis team is in their last week of the regular season as sectional started on October 4th. The Lady Tigers came up with a huge victory against Beaumont to bring the Golden Racket back to heights this season. The girls were down none two to Beaumont, but then went on to win their next three matches to secure the Golden Racket. There have been a lot of positives already this cross-country season. The boys' team is led by senior Braden Gallagher, who has had several top 15 finishes, including first place at the Madison Invitation. Junior Javon Pryor continues to get better each week, 
setting personal records as the boys' number two runner. For the first time in years, Heights Cross Country is fielding, fielding all full teams. In terms of events, this year's musical will be Matilda opening the first week of November. In addition, 10th and 11th graders are preparing for the PSAT next Thursday. As we return to school for the 2021 and 22 year, Heights High students are eager to get back to school and all of the associated activities. The RISE theme has been initiated, focusing on smooth transitions, not just back to normal, but to a better school. Everybody is enjoying a much easier year in many ways, after the struggles that many students faced last year. Sports and clubs are back in session, and students are ready to excel at academics to make up for the losses incurred during the pandemic. Next, I would like to talk about the reunite aspect of our new theme, RISE. Since the school year has begun, I have seen students reuniting with their friends and classmates after being distant since the pandemic. It's been a great joy to see many of the students reunite with old friends. It's been especially great to see all the athletes that have reunited with their teams because they chose not to participate in sports last year due to the, due to the pandemic. Overall, it's been exciting to jump back into activities and hang out with friends. Now, certainly not everything is perfect and obstacles are not limited to just the school. I recently delivered testimony to the Ohio State House regarding House Bill 322 and House Bill 327, which threatened to hurt the education of Ohio students by prohibiting divisive concepts and discussion of current events within schools. This threatens the tradition of civil discourse that is central to a strong democratic society. Just because some students or parents are uncomfortable with a subject, we cannot insist on sheltering them from the reality of the world. Our public schools were created for the purpose of cultivating free thinking and responsible citizenry. Therefore, we cannot allow this to be compromised. The CHUH school district will continue to strive for improvement, delivering an excellent education and a variety of other great opportunities to all of the students. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, students. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The next item is a special address with Mayor Brennan um, from University Heights. Michael, you want to come to the podium? Although I am in your seat this evening. <laughs> um, most of you may or may, may maybe not know the reason we relocated our meetings here um, is because the high school is planning for their school play and there's no room on the stage for us. And we decided to come here not to inconvenience them. So we are in the temporary chambers of University Heights at Wiley School. Mm -hmm. And last month we discussed a little bit the, about the uh, service garage and the bus depot. And yes. basically yes. we wanted you to be there, but you had a family emergency. I, I did. I did. So thank you for understanding uh, a month ago. And uh, thank you for having me here this evening. Uh, I, I, haven't been in this room enough to feel as if I have a home court advantage quite yet. And, and it does feel different to be at the podium as opposed to sitting where you're sitting, Mr. Posh. But, but um, I, I, I do feel the need to comment. Um, Ms. Turner was referring to the golden racket, uh, the student. Who, and uh, I had the pleasure of being present for the Heights versus Beaumont tennis match and saw that last doubles match uh, at length. Uh, the, both teams just played fiercely. And I have never seen, uh, I'd be betraying if I said I've watched a lot of tennis, but I've never seen uh, <laughs> that kind of tennis match and that level of competition and just how all the athletes played their hearts out. And, and I had the honor of awarding the Golden Racket, presenting the Golden Racket to the team captains of the Heights uh, tennis team. So it was my pleasure to do that. And as that matchup goes back to Cleveland Heights next year, uh, I know that both coaches for both uh, Heights and Beaumont are interested in seeing the, the new Cleveland Heights mayor get to make that presentation in Cleveland Heights and be that a Mayor Saren or a Mayor Danforth, uh, hopeful to see a tradition that, that blooms from this. So. Uh, just wanted to mention that. So um, thank you, Mr. Posh. Thank you, Ms. Rini, Ms. Lewis, uh, Ms. Wright, Mr. Hines, uh, Superintendent Kirby, and Mr. Gaynor for having me here this evening. Uh, I'm Michael Dillon Brennan. I'm the mayor of the city of University Heights. And 
uh, as mentioned, the um, City of University Heights is working with Cleveland Heights University Heights School District to find ways to make our community assets work better for our shared constituents. And this meeting room right here is one of those efforts. So thank you for working with us on this. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you back here. Uh, it's uh, kind of a guest in your own home, I suppose, <laughs> having you here in this room. Uh, we're still obviously working out some of the kinks, and uh, but uh, it seems like we are streaming well now, and that is uh, that's good. That's good. So I'm here to uh, address and discuss briefly that there have been joint efforts by the City of University Heights and the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District. Um, as an aside, from the city's point of view, to our own ongoing facilities study, um, that we aspire to keep making. Uh, regarding the ongoing review of additional uses we might make at this site, the, the former Wiley Middle School property. Um, our city consultants concluded that um, this is not a decision, of course, but, but just a possibility whether it was feasible, concluded that the city of University Heights could potentially move its service yard to this site in a way that would coexist with the proposed return of the bus depot to this site. And the issue of the potential return of the bus depot is before the City of University Heights Planning Commission this Thursday evening. In my view, it isn't a question of whether we should move the city service yard to this property, but whether in addition to that, there are further ways that we can work together regarding uses of this site. Understanding, of course, that, um, that, that we are still in a position where we are exploring, and you know, when I say we, I also, I especially mean you, the school board, are exploring the educational purposes that this site may still have. Um, by the next city council meeting, I do anticipate providing to, publicly to the city of University Heights, an update on the municipal facilities study that we are performing by way of background. Uh, the University Heights City Hall has been at uh, the intersection of Silsby and Warrensville Center Road, 2300 Warrensville Center Road, since 1925. Uh, it was built around the time the village of Idlewood was changing its name to then the town of University Heights, not yet a city. Uh, that, that building is obsolete and outdated. It was retrofitted around 1961 and has had no meaningful update since then. Uh, the fire department was built in 1941. The, police department in the 50s, and all of the city's municipal facilities are out of date, obsolete, and uh, decrepit, if I may say so. So uh, we have been exploring and are starting our exploration at 2300 Warrensville, but one of the things that was preliminarily determined in the study was the desirability to move the city's service yard off-site from 2300 Warrensville, which then begged the question, where in University Heights could we possibly put it? And one of those possibilities happened to be here at Wiley. And from a city point of view, there has been, you know, admittedly some, uh, we've been somewhat circumspect about the idea of the return of the bus depot. We haven't necessarily been en enthused about it uh, preliminarily because it was one thing to have it when we had a middle school here and without the school having the depot, it, it, it seemed like, well, it, does, it, it seemed as if we had one feature of having a school building here without actually having the school. And it also seemed as if, what else are we doing with the property if it's only a bus depot? Well, here we're now exploring other uses in addition to that bus depot that are beneficial to our shared constituencies. And that is something that we can be excited about and are excited about. So as we look at, with, through our planning commission, the, uh, a cooperative way of returning the bus depot to the city of University Heights, as well as looking at other and different uses, whether it's the, a city service yard or, or other functions, I am delighted that we are working together as a city and a school district to find ways to use these community assets to serve our shared constituencies. So um, 
I want to let the public know that, of course, no decisions at this point have actually been made, but that we are all working together to explore different options and to do this in service to you, the public. So uh, we wanted to have uh, a few moments here at a school board meeting to share that with um, the public. Uh, we've done that also at uh, our own University at City Council meetings, but that's why I'm here. Uh, it's why I intended to be here a month ago. I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk a little bit about that and to answer any questions or address any other points that any member of the uh, board may have. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions at all? Well, you know, I think it's every opportunity that we can find that um, to share uh, sites, services, facilities that our taxpayers have paid for um, is winner winner. We, you know, the, the more that we can leverage the facilities that we already have for the taxpayers' benefit is fantastic. Um, Mayor, when were you sort of thinking in terms of presenting in drawings or that sort of thing, site plans? Mm -hmm. Um, is, is there a timetable for that? There isn't a timetable for that quite yet. Um, we did a rough drawing. I'm not, I didn't bring it with me this evening because it wasn't intended to be something for the community to really consider. It was more, can we feasibly put the service yard here as well as the bus depot here? Does it all fit within the footprint? And the uh, consultants that we were using, um, both yours and ours, agreed that it could all fit. Whether the way it was drawn out, roughed out, whether that would be the way we would actually do it versus the fact that we could actually do it. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that I don't, we don't have a drawing with respect to what we expect a potential service yard here to look like, except that we believe that we can fit one uh, here on the property, even with the bus depot as proposed for Thursday night. So um, we were comfortable, as were your own consultants, in proceeding with your bus depot application without making any major changes to that drawing, knowing that there was ample space to add in for future development a potential city service yard. So just for the sake of clarity, the area on this property that we're talking about is the back where the trailers were and beyond that. So there is on Tuesday night an application that the school district is putting forth to University Heights. Thursday night. Thursday night. Yes. About moving the bus depot and sharing the bus depot with essentially the, you know, our plans for that for the city of University Heights. Um, you know, this is the first step for permitting and really getting a sense of really where this is going to go. That will eventually come to us for a decision. Um, so until that happens, there is no decision. Right. Um, but we do know that we have to vacate the property on Mayfield Road as soon as we possibly can. We have six months on a lease. There's a, there's a provision in the lease that we have, although I'd love to stay out. Yeah, honestly, if we can stay in Mayfield Road, on that site of Mayfield Road, that'd be great. It's, it's, it's cheap compared to what it's going to cost us to build a bus depot, but we have to take care of the buses so they'll run. And putting it here where the bus garage already is and the fuel depot makes really the most sense. And we've worked with the city of Cleveland Heights in trying to find locations. They can't find any. You look on a map, you can't find any, any other places that are large enough in University Heights. Our staff looked at places and they found a place in East Cleveland, but that's just way, way too far away to serve our kids. So there's a, there's a lot of moving parts here, but the area that we're talking about is in the back of the building. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure my orientation is <laughs> yes, yes, it's, it's that way. Yeah, it's so way. it preserves the building it preserves the school for considerations for academics. It also leaves the door open if there's no academic options for this building to 
do some economic development work with the city um, or find a buyer for it if we choose to do so. Sorry. Mayor Brennan, yes. we, we already share resources with the diesel tanks we do. with the city of University Heights, correct? Uh, yes, yes, the diesel and the uh, regular. Regular the, gasoline, yes. okay. Um, do you have service pits for mechanics over in your current setup? We do, and it was contemplated that with, um, in, in determining the feasibility of a service yard here for the city, we weren't necessarily looking at, we were not looking at shared um, service pits, not shared service garages. We were looking at having our own separate service garage with our own employees, and there was still room for that. One of the things we were looking to share um, and would add here, uh, we accounted for the addition of a new uh, full-size salt barn, uh, much larger than the one the city currently has on site at 2300 Warrensville. That particular salt barn is only good for about two medium-sized snowfalls. Mm -hmm. And we keep about 1,800 additional tons in the Cleveland Heights salt barn up at the Noble Road oh, no, service yard. Right. Now, I think we're all aware of the desirability of investing in the Noble neighborhood and cleaning up the service yard that Cleveland Heights currently has in that neighborhood. That will be key to that. Mm -hmm. And as that is done, one of the things that University Heights was looking to do was to be able to finally build its own salt barn on some site. And, and here, the bus depot, the city service yard, and a salt barn, which could also, and we discussed, the possibility of providing the salt that the school district needs out of the salt barn that University Heights would build here. And you could do that without sacrificing the salt that you need for the streets. Correct. It would be a large enough facility to How big are we handle about? the city as well as the schools. How large a salt dome are we talking about? Ish? Well, that I'd have to go back to the engineers about. Okay. All right. Uh, Never mind. I'm getting into the weeds. So. I, well, yes, but I do know that, that we typically keep about 400 tons, or excuse me, I think 200 tons on site at, at University Heights, and we keep an additional 1,800 at the Noble Road Barn in addition to the salt that Cleveland Heights keeps there. So as Cleveland Heights at some point explores how it's going to handle its future service needs and how it reinvests in the Noble neighborhood, uh, we don't have to worry, we don't have to find ourselves worrying, just like you don't want to find yourselves worrying with regard to Park Synagogue, how we handle this aspect of uh, very essential uh, city service. You know, we, right. we obviously have to have salt for the roads. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mayor and Jim, um, what are the next steps for this? I know there's the meeting on Thursday, but what, what comes after that? Well, we mm -hmm. have the meeting on Thursday before the Planning Commission on the bus depot, mm -hmm. which uh, I chair the Planning Commission. I, I, I'm only one of five votes, but, but I, I look favorably upon the application. Generally, obviously, there's four other people that will be expressing their views, and, and we will, of course, go through the process and make sure it is everything it ought to be both for you and for the city. Um, we are also ourselves having our own meeting uh, imminently with our own consultants to get a status um, regarding our own study with respect to 2300 Warrensville. Um, the scope of our original municipal facilities study focused on 2300 Warrensville, not on Wiley or some other site. The side study of whether Wiley could be used for a service yard was in service of the idea that the service yard would need to be relocated in order to build an adequately sized administration building, an adequately sized police station, an adequately sized firehouse. Currently, neither the full police department nor the full fire department exists within the existing police station building or firehouse because neither of them are adequately sized to handle 21st century policing or fire and EMS. Amazingly, the detective bureau is located in a house <laughs> and the fire administration uh, and fire prevention bureau are located also in a house 
next door to that Detective Bureau house. And, and neither one of those situations is optimal. So I think what we're trying to see is there's a plan that's going to be presented to the city of University Heights that need to, they need to digest. We're still walking down a path to get our bus depot mm -hmm. approved mm -hmm. and considered for our, our vote. I believe we hope to have that done in the next month or two. Um, it needs to get reviewed by the lay uh, facilities uh, committee before it would come to us. I do believe that they've already been shared preliminary pictures of it. There's a series of options with the bus depot. One of them includes a significant number of solar panels or making it solar ready. So we'll have to decide if that's a worthwhile expense um, or you try to keep it bare minimum. Um, so those, those items will be prepared. I'd like to hold a meeting with the city of Cleveland Heights, University Heights, the library, and us in the month of November to talk a little bit more about this regionalism and give the city of Cleveland Heights the opportunity to uh, chime in. I mean, we've, we've made a commitment to try to all work together when it comes to our facilities and when we need to make big decisions on you know, building projects. So we need to follow through on that commitment, which is what we're, which is what we're doing. Um, this just sort of came up, and I, uh, Mayor Brennan and myself thought it was important to make sure that this board was aware of these conversations that were taking place in University Heights without fully having a vetted plan, because there's going to have to be some input that we're going to have to be able to provide for that. Mm -hmm. But you know, the whole purpose of this is trying to find ways of saving money by working together. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And, and that, that also goes both ways because, uh, uh, for instance, we just had a fire department open house on, on, on Sunday. And, and it was an excellent opportunity for myself and other elected officials here in University Heights to, to, to meet with our, our residents, our constituents. And, you know, the subject of Wiley constantly comes up. They don't necessarily perceive that there is activity here, although I think we can all agree that the activity is not yet come anywhere near to the highest and best use that the site could potentially have. So lots of folks have lots of ideas of what could happen here, many of which uh, don't necessarily comport with what we're already trying to do. But we do want to let the public know that this is not just a vacant building sitting fallow with no lights on, with no activity. There are things that are going on and there's a lot of exploration both by this school board or, or in, you know, individuals uh, with Ms. Kirby and the, and the school administration, mm -hmm. as well as the administration of the city of University Heights. You know, we, we want to make sure that we have something useful and vibrant and serves all of our constituencies uh, here uh, in the heart of our city. We, we obviously don't want to close school building, and if it's not going to be a school, we do want things that nevertheless serve the public, serve the community, and are in service to all of our goals. And I feel like I started, I may have jumped in on something you wanted to say, Ms. Serini. No, thank you. I appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, Mayor Brennan. Yes, Ms. Wright. Yes, you can't see for the mask. <laughs> um, yeah, all the services you all are looking at, all the uh, University High City services here at the Wiley campus. I mean, that's the police station, the firehouse. Well, we're, we're talking about the service department minimally. That okay. was the, the, the part that we were looking at initially, was whether the service yard could be placed here in a clean and contained way. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be the equipment that we use for uh, uh, solid waste and recycling pickup, uh -huh. for, for yard waste, for composting, for, for our, our uh, street sweepers mm -hmm. and, and our uh, bombardiers. I know the, I don't, I don't, tease the Cleveland Heights folks a little bit. We actually plow our sidewalks in University Heights, yes, and we have nice. equipment that we use to do that. And, and, and they're just these cute little, they, they're, they're, you know, they have a little uh, plow on them, and they just zip along our sidewalks. And I've had a few folks in Cleveland Heights say, hey, you think we can do a little bit of that over here? And that well, you know, nice. maybe we could. You know, <laughs> we could have worked together and do something like that. But the point is, is we have all this equipment that needs to be somewhere. And if you ever were to come to our service yard, which you know, is a service yard. A lot of our equipment is parked outside all year round. 
and that is to the detriment of the longevity of that equipment. Uh, garbage trucks should, just, should not just be parked outside all the time. Kubotas should not be parked outside. Uh, dump trucks should not just be parked outside. The, 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 the cherry picker boom that's on uh, the back of a truck that, that goes and, and, and lifts you know, lights and, and, and you know, puts up the snowflakes in the wintertime and changes out signs over intersections, there's like 17,000 miles on that truck, but the, the arm's about to rust and fall off because we don't have a garage for it. Hmm. So what we want to do is be able to garage this equipment for the, um, for the longevity of that equipment, for the, uh, to preserve those investments, and have a very clean, sleek area for, for, for doing those things and making room for a larger police station, larger firehouse, and ultimately a new administration building with community rooms and so on that better serve um, the city of University Heights and the, and the public over here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And uh, to be continued. Thanks. And uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Anything else? No, I don't think so. All right. Thank v you. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you. Okay. Mayor sure. Thank you. Moving on to statements from the audience. Uh, please note citizens' remarks are limited to five minutes each. As per board policy 9700, school facilities or equipment may not be used as a means of producing or disseminating to the community any materials that adversely or promotes a political party, a political cause, or candidacy of an individual for a public office. Students and employees of the board shall not be used to distribute campaign literature within the schools or on school grounds. Please. I ask, please don't use this meeting for political purposes. This is our rule, and I ask speakers tonight to follow these rules, but I do not intend to stop the meeting if you choose to disregard the rules. Do we have any students in the audience that would like to make a presentation this evening? You, <laughs> you want to come up and state your name? She goes to the podium. Please, go ahead. Are you able to keep everything within five minutes? Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hey. Hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Dan Selhorst. I'm the operations manager at Open Doors Academy. Uh, you may recall that we came to speak to you at your last open comment. Um, during that session, we were hoping to have uh, one of our interns and one of our scholars speak to you about their experience at our summer camp at Monticello Middle School. Um, our scholar, was, she was just not feeling well that day, um, but we, we still wanted her to have the opportunity, the, the leadership opportunity to speak and talk about her experience. So we've come back today to for, give her an opportunity to talk about her experience at camp. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Miss Olivia Jacobs, who is a seventh grader at Roxborough Middle School. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Olivia Jacobs, and I attended ODA summer camp at Monticello Middle School, and I'm here to talk about my experience at the summer camp. Here's what I thought. I thought the camp would be like stereotypical camp, boring and non-fun <laughs> and stuff, but the camp proved me wrong. I have some examples of how it proved me wrong and how I became from an introvert to an extrovert when attending to that camp. My first example is engineering camp. When I first walked into the camp, I thought, wow, this is really loud in here. I'm not gonna make no friends in here. <laughs> and I was just sitting there waiting for them to like call us into our camp. I saw some people I knew and I was like, oh, I know that person, it's gonna go great. My uh, first day at the camp, well, we're, it was engineer camp, and we had to build robot hands. And of course I was scared, because I didn't know how to build nothing. <laughs> I wasn't even taught. <laughs> um, I thought it was gonna be so hard, and we're gonna have to put a whole bunch of screws in and stuff, but the teacher was there, Mr. Justin. He helped me along the way, and my friend Dylan did. Um, and I was like, whoa, this is really easy. I didn't know that you could make a robot hand this way. And we had to build rovers. I'm like, oh, God, we have to build rovers. <laughs> and 
like again, I was proved wrong. It wasn't really that hard because my teacher and my friends were there to help me and I made a lot of friends. My second example is H2O camp. And of course, I was really nervous because when I walked into that classroom or room, <coughs> I saw a whole bunch of people that I didn't know. And I bet they didn't even know me. But I saw them, I was like, oh, they look mean and they look rude and stuff. That's why I sat down in the front and I really didn't talk to anybody. But, um, Towards the end of the day, I actually made a lot of friends there, and they turned out to be really nice. And I really liked them. But here we are at the end now. <coughs> but thank you so much for having me here, and thank you so much for putting the camp up. And now I'm an extrovert, and I'm not really shy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your story. I'm sorry you couldn't be with us last month, but I'm yes. very, very glad you came this month. Me thank too. you. Yes. And you're a great public speaker, too. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other students that would like to make presentations this evening? Yeah. Let's move on to the list. Um, Karen Rigo, who would like to talk about our sub crisis. Hi there. Thank you, President Posh, board members, Superintendent Kirby, and Treasurer Gaynor for the opportunity to speak. My name is Karen Rigo, and I am the president of Cleveland Heights Teachers Union. So you wake up one morning with a sick child, and you immediately have to make a decision. Is he well enough to go to daycare and have that extreme parental guilt, or do you take the day off and have the extreme teacher guilt? Because it is likely there will be no substitute and a colleague will have to fill in. It is a tough choice and a no-win <coughs> situation. I am very empathetic to this situation because it has happened to me twice this year. Once I had to choose parent guilt and once I chose teacher guilt. Neither were a great choice. No one should have to be put in this position, but unfortunately it's happening to some of our members every single day. We have gone from a substitute inconvenience to a substitute crisis. Counselors, school psychs, Teachers, ancillaries, principals, and even our paraprofessionals are subbing. Our members lose their planning time, and in some cases, they are losing their lunch. It is not sustainable to expect our members to continue at this pace through the remainder of the year. You may be aware that Local 795 filed a grievance on this issue. We don't want to hear that there is a nationwide shortage. We are aware. We don't want to hear that it's a crisis everywhere. We are aware. We want to hear what our district leadership is going to do to solve the problem that affects the people here in Cleveland Heights University Heights School District. We want to know what you're going to do to solve the problem for our students and our staff. Here are just a few of our concerns. Absences put in weeks in advance are not being filled with substitutes. Teachers are asked daily to substitute during their planning, some teachers in secondary classrooms are taking on multiple class periods at a time, which, by the way, is keeping our buildings going. That is why we haven't had to close yet. Elementary specials are being canceled so that specialists can sub in homerooms, which means kids find out the day of that they have no PE, no music, or art, or STEM, or world language, which in a lot of our students' cases is their favorite reason for coming to school and then they find out they don't have it. How do we continue to ask our teachers to do two jobs and sacrifice family time because they have no time to plan lessons or catch up on paperwork? This is a completely unacceptable and problem and we need to find creative ways to solve the substitute shortage. Let's be really clear, this is not due to excessive teacher absences. We don't believe the absence rate is different from previous years. However, the district's inability to be creative and hire substitutes is the problem. Our union wrote a creative letter of understanding that is in the hands of administration to help try to solve the problem. We stand firm that we are willing to work out 
solutions to the crisis. It is time to stop admiring and fix it. Thank you. Tiffany. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you, President Posh, board members, Superintendent Kirby, and Treasurer Gaynor for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Tiffany Underheil. I am the middle school teacher, or I'm sorry, middle school tiger virtual academy teacher. It's quite a mouthful. And the first vice president of the Cleveland Heights Teachers Union. I'm here to speak to you tonight about the substitute crisis we are experiencing. There is not a day that goes by that I do not receive communications from fellow teachers in this district about being assigned to cover classes because of unfilled teacher absences. When a teacher is called to cover for another teacher's absence, this results in a loss of planning time. Planning time is essential in our profession. It is used to grade papers, review formative and summative assessment data, contact parents, plan meaningful lessons, make copies, and even use the restroom. These things cannot be done when you have students in front of you. If a teacher loses his or her planning to cover a class, the need for the planning does not go away. This means that in order to cover a class, one must give up time outside of the normal workday to get the planning done. Often, this is done at the expense of family time and or personal time. Sometimes, family time just cannot be rescheduled which means the planning does not get done. The teachers lose the time to plan, and if they are losing the time to plan, they are not just losing time. They are losing the ability to prepare meaningful, data-driven lessons. Some teachers are being asked to cover during their collaborative team planning time as well. This is time that teachers use to meet with the teacher-based teams to do required TBT forms for the Ohio improvement process. This time is also used for team meetings, IEP and 504 meetings, parent meetings, and department meetings. Missing these meetings because of the district's failure to secure substitutes means that the teacher who is covering a class is not in a part of a meeting where he or she is needed. The requirement to turn in a TBT form does not go away because a teacher has to cover a class. We need to address the substitute crisis and not admire the problem. We need substitutes. Until such time as substitutes can be found, we need every licensed staff member in this district that can sub to sub, so that the teachers are not the only ones bearing the burden <coughs> of this crisis. We need all hands on deck. Thank you. Thank you. Tamar. Good evening, everybody. Evening. President Posh, Superintendent Kirby, board members, <laughs> and um, Treasurer Gaynor. Didn't want to leave anybody out. My name is Tamara Gray. I'm a proud resident, taxpayer, and music teacher at Fairfax and Boulevard Elementary Schools. And also, I'm second vice president of Local 795. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. And I'm going to do the repeat sign that a teacher does and go repeat. I realize it's redundant, but we have a substitute problem. <laughs> However, I need you to hear how it affects our students who, the specials, UAs, creative arts, whichever name you choose, how it affects in that manner. Our specials classes in elementary school not only serve as an important part of a student's academic day, but also as part of their social emotional learning. At this time when our students need the social emotional release and the value of music, art, PE, Spanish, and STEM, that it brings to the lives, they become a casualty caught up in the middle of this substitute dilemma. Our specials teachers are now, as you heard, being pulled to cancel their classes to cover the classroom. In a desperation for subs, I understand, and we understand, when this occurs occasionally. However, when it becomes the normal expectation, it creates a larger problem. Instead of 20 students being affected, you are now changing the lives of 120 students since we have six classes a day. Every teacher gets their $23 for missing um, the, their valuable planning time. The specialist is being paid for teaching outside of their regular duties, by the way, which I will be the first to say is not easy to uh, go into a classroom and 
take over for that classroom teacher. And we have 23 times six, that's 138, plus 139 for the extra duty that the teacher does, we're at 277. Also, when we are absent and have secured a sub ahead of time, the, that sub is taken and reassigned to another class, which we realize that is problematic and that that would happen. But I think subs are getting a hold of that and thinking there's going to be a rope-a-dope. I'm coming in for music, but I'm going to end up in a classroom. So we have to be careful of that. The social emotional value to the student that day is lost again. What do we do? We do what it takes to secure as many qualified subs as possible by being competitive with our sub pack. I realize desperate times call for desperate measures, but it cannot be at the expense of our students' social, emotional well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Betsy? Good evening, President Posh, board members, Superintendent Kirby, and Treasurer Gaynor. In case you don't know, my name is Betsy Race, and I'm a school counselor at Boulevard Elementary School. I have worked in the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District for 38 plus years. I student taught at Coventry. I worked as a kindergarten aide. I taught at Oxford. Uh, then I became a school counselor where I've been at both the middle school and the elementary school levels. I am and always have been committed to Tiger Nation, even before it was Tiger Nation, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I truly do believe that I bleed black and gold. And I say that because I'm here tonight for the first time speaking in front of the Board of Education to tell you my passion and my concern. So I have two concerns I want to speak to you about. Um, 38 plus years, I, I've seen a lot in my tenure as an educator, but absolutely none of it could truly prepare me for what this return to school has been this year. Each and every day, I witness the effects of the pandemic on our students. Daily support of students who have lost a family member, a friend of the family to COVID is very real. Helping students remember how to do school after a year plus away from the routine is very real. Supporting students relearn social skills with peers after seclusion from their friends is very real. The social emotional impact will be felt for quite a while, I suspect, but for right now it is at its peak, it is so intense, and having a huge effect on the students, the staff, the families, quite honestly, I'm quite certain all of us, as we try to navigate this time. So my, one of my two concerns and requests is that the board consider, when you're looking at uh, allocating ESSER funds, that you hire additional trained staff to help support staff, myself included, tackle these issues which are so significant and we are right in the middle of it. If we aren't able to help our students regulate their emotions, process the events in their lives, honestly, I believe the academics won't matter. The social emotional learning needs to be considered as it is critical, especially at this time. Which brings me to my second concern. I too want to speak about the shortage of substitute teachers all over the district and you're hearing it and I know you probably already know mm -hmm. staff, teachers, support staff and even principals are substituting and covering daily for teachers who are out. I myself have subbed four times. Okay, I'm not going to lie. I love being in the classroom. <laughs> it was kind of wonderful. Got me away from some other stuff. But what happens when that happens is that I'm not able to do my direct service of students who need my emotional support right now when I'm pulled to sub. And I'm sure that statement applies to many who are covering classrooms. I know that this is a problem all over Northeast Ohio and Ohio and the Midwest and the whole country. That I'm certain. 
but I'm asking you along with my colleagues to consider finding whatever way is necessary to hire subs so that all of us, myself included, um, can stop filling in for absent teachers and get back to our work. Thank you all of you for listening and for your consideration and I can't go without saying, go Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Thank you very much for making these presentations and bringing this up to us. Um, Liz, can you and your president's report oh, give us just it. kind of a, mm -hmm. an update? I'm going to speak to that. And mm -hmm. whatever you can in our weekly reports, if you can just mm -hmm. give us some data and numbers just so we yeah. can better understand the, the severity of the problem. Yeah, and I, I would say I don't know one district that's having a sub-crisis right now, um, given the COVID situation and the challenge just in hiring people in general for any role in almost any industry. Um, but I'll speak a little bit more to that in my report. Okay, thank you. Joan Sperl. Good evening. I'm going to present a testimony that I gave in Columbus in May for in favor of fair school funding. Um, thank you for having me, all of you. Okay. My name is Joan Spurl. I'm a proud resident of Cleveland Heights and parent of a junior at Heights High who has attended our public schools since kindergarten. My husband and I attended public schools and between us have received undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate education at Stanford University, Harvard University, the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, Northwestern University, and Tufts University. I don't say this to be boastful, but simply to verify that we know about and value quality education and share our founding fathers' convictions about education's critical place in elevating humanity and the common good, upholding our democracy, and that it should be the highest priority of government free of political influence. We share their high aspirations and vision of a system so grand that in John Adams' words, quote, it is unknown to any other people, ancient or modern, unquote and that knowledge must become so general as to raise the lower ranks of society to the higher." Unquote. I want to express my thanks to all involved in bringing this long-sought wonderful opportunity for you to fulfill the Founders' vision and the oath you swore to the Ohio Constitution and to the vast majority of Ohio's children when you pass and fund this well-researched, well-crafted, and well-vetted legislation made in, by, and for Ohioans. I entered the field of early childhood education 30 years ago after studying public policy in college. I recognized then what research and my own experience have borne out, that generous investments in the continuum, continuum of human development from the earliest years and into adulthood pay immense dividends down the line. On the other hand, in Ohio, we see how people and communities pay a price when government fails to invest as fairly and robustly as the founders intended. In recent decades, our local public school system hasn't received the dependable, consistent, and robust financial government support the founders intended. Some people told us we shouldn't send our child to the public schools, but we are pleased with our choice. As a family, we support and work towards the founders' vision of a common public system that brings together all types of people in our own beloved racially and socioeconomically diverse public school community, open to and uplifting all and striving to excel despite difficult odds. When I listened to testimony relating to state education policies last February, I was struck by the oft-repeated themes from public school supporters from every kind of community in Ohio. Small, medium, large, rural, and urban. Rural community members describe their public schools as the heart or center of their community. Many voice pride about how their public schools welcome and serve all who need them, turn away no one, weaving together all kinds of children and families, forming a beautiful tapestry of community. But I also learned that my community isn't unique in finding its beautiful fabric too often weakened or rent by the state's current funding model and other education policies. I heard about the divisions created in all kinds of communities by the need for levy campaigns to simply keep up with inflation and the unfortunate consequences of budget cuts when those levies fail. I also heard both Republican and Democratic legislators and citizens testify that the state report card is deeply flawed and has actually harmed children in communities who need and deserve the state's support and investment. 
The legislature is constitutionally mandated to provide adequate and equitable funding so every student in every public school district has the benefit of a sound education, regardless of the community's capacity to fund its public schools. Such a constitutional imperative is your first and dominant duty. Instead of being supported by the state, our schools face the awful dilemma of cutting the budget and compromising the well-being of the children they serve or asking for more dollars from local property owners, many struggling themselves just to keep pace with inflation. You can end this dilemma and strengthen Ohio communities in the future workforce. Just think of how public schools and the families they serve can thrive with fair and predictable funding. They can plan, build, and grow free from the uncertainties and inefficiencies of the current model. The state can collaborate with local school communities to explore and enact the best educational practices. Funding public education fairly is one of your primary constitutional responsibilities. You have the opportunity right now at long last to fulfill that responsibility. That was my testimony in Columbus Thank you. in favor of fair school funding. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Sherry? Hi, I'm Sherry Naxon. I live in Cleveland Heights. And I wanted to check in. As you all know, I um, collect all the information from the Tiger Nation Hive comments. I weed out the emotions and the, the things that aren't going to get us to actionable steps, and I email you a report on a routine basis. And since community members often ask me um, what we hear back from you, and they also often wonder why some of what we're submitting isn't making it to these meetings. And so I wanted to ask, is there something that we can do differently I was trying to submit the reports in advance of your meetings and then noticing that it wasn't impacting your agendas. Um, I'm not really sure what else to do. Sometimes I get a confirmation email back from Superintendent Kirby most of the time that I know she's gotten it, but I actually, I haven't heard back from many of you in a long time. Um, in addition, we've started having forums. You know, I was recommending listening sessions to all of you over the past year community members still are saying that they want to be heard and they want to see that reflected in the work that's happening. And so we've started doing our forums. You've all been invited. You're always invited. And I think the forums are probably going to be continuous at this point because the initial forums, everyone wanted to meet again. And I would say it wraps in really well with your equity goal of having parent meetings. And we're having really nice participation in that. You know, to remind you, the top concerns that have been coming up, I think people have been concerned that COVID issues haven't been discussed in the meetings. There's been a lot of presentations about other topics. And at the same rate, parents are bringing concerns about classroom sizes, um, about the way COVID notifications happen. I will say that. Catherine Kavanaugh has been really responsive and we've seen changes in language and changes in types of information that's going out in those notices, but parents are asking um, the definition of close contact, um, rules about quarantining, how contact tracing is happening. Um, there, we've brought to you in our report the bus um, driver shortage and issues around that as well as you know, what we're hearing tonight about the sub shortage. I think there's just so many concerns and I do my best to really, I know, I feel like about a year ago, somebody asked and Jody responded that unless you have someone in the community who can filter through all these responses and condense it into two or three pages, it's very hard for all of you to keep up with all of those comments. And that's why I started doing it, was I was getting, quite honestly, I got frustrated because it just felt like people were getting emotional and not bringing it to you. And so I started doing the reports for you as a way to make it easier. And I organize it by theme. You know, I take out the redundancies. I take out some of the highly charged comments. But we're wondering now, what more can we do? Because it does feel like we're bringing it all to you in a nice presentation, but we're not seeing it impact discussion, and if it's not discussed here, we're wondering where will it be discussed and when will it be discussed. Thank you. 
Can I just, I just wanted to share one thing. Um, and I do uh, read the summaries every week. Thank you, Shari. The most recent ones I haven't gotten to because we had some other things we were planning around. Um, but I do want you to know that I read them and then those things that apply to different departments mm -hmm. within the organization, um, I'll review that with those department heads and see if there are some adjustments that need to be made um, as relates to that. So for example, um, in one of the reports, there was concern about students in the high school consistently wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And so the very next day, I visited the high school myself um, just to kind of observe that. Uh, to see if that was an issue and to kind of talk to folks on ways, uh, some creative ways we can address that. I can tell you one thing that I found that is challenging at our high school that's different than our middle schools and our elementary schools. Those students get mass breaks, mm -hmm. but for the high school students, uh, those passing periods are likely the only time they get a mass break because students aren't really going off campus. As I was walking through the halls, you know, teachers were reminding students to keep their masks up, other staff were reminding them the students were responsive, so you know, we have a bit of mass fatigue going on, but you know, that's something that we immediately followed up, followed up on. So I don't want you to feel like those reports are for naught. Um, and I see my role as a superintendent mm -hmm. to review those pieces and make sure it gets filtered back. So just because it's not a part of um, a formal presentation, this is not the only venue where, where, where things are addressed. And I just want you to know that. And perhaps people do think that that's the case, but I meet weekly for three hours at the cabinet and we look at multiple issues. We Discuss, discuss COVID, you know, every week we discuss uh, TVA, like, so these are things that we're constantly talk, looking at um, and making adjustments as needed. I, we appreciate that, and, and, I, and I do have faith in all of that. I think one of the things that's disheartening, honestly, is to have a Board of Education convening in the middle of all of this, and that there have been multiple meetings where these were not topics at all. And, um, and so there's a concern about that the community oversight. I mean, that's what the Board of Education is, and so there should be a communication happening here that this is the public forum, and I think that's also how people feel that assurance. So I'm grateful for what you're doing. It's hard for everybody to see that unless it's mentioned, and we're so glad that you mention it, and it's a good reminder that you have these other venues, mm -hmm. but I really encourage you all to make sure that you're discussing some of these hot topics here. I mean, the way TVA is unfolding is happening in real time. The classroom sizes during a pandemic is happening in real time. So when parents sit through a meeting that includes a lot of things that are more organizational, systemic, structural, mm -hmm. long term, it, it reverberates. They feel not heard, and they, you know, and they're they're wondering where am I going to get that information? Mm -hmm. And that's I think what I'm trying to bring to you is that including that here is so important. And I know it feels like it's talking about hard things and sad things or things that may be hard to fix but it's also acknowledging the reality, and I think that's what families are asking for. And staff, I mean, you're hearing it from the staff too themselves tonight. Well, I appreciate so. that feedback. Yeah. Um, again, I, I do give weekly, re, week, I'm sorry, monthly reports, um, and I'm pretty sure the last several of those we talked specifically about um, some of the things around COVID, definitions mm -hmm. of close contact, those things as well. So I'll continue to Mm -hmm. um, review that uh, feedback and um, integrate that information as needed, and I appreciate it. Thank I respect you. that, and it's not a challenge of you. It's not your presentation. I think people are wanting to see the discussion amongst the board, mm -hmm. quite frankly. So that's it. I don't want it to sound like it, like people don't see what you're reading, what you've written. We, we do. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shari. We have a um, Malia and Liz and I meet. Uh, weekly, if it's not weekly, it's every other week. I'll make sure we add this item to our agenda just to make sure. And we do watch things. So, for example, I know you had a listening session, and there were tons of conflicts, and Lisa Hunt was on. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we're very connected and understand what's going on. But, but thank you for coming tonight and, and making such a nice constructive comments for us. Uh, Maureen Lynn. Good evening. Um, thank you, President Posh, Treasurer Gaynor, Superintendent Curry, and the rest of the school board. Um, good evening. My name is Maureen Lynn, and I lived, I've been living in Cleveland Heights for 10 years now with my family. Tonight I want to talk about transparency, because this board talks about how important transparency is. So I'm sure you're aware of the complaint filed by the Ohio Court of Claims 
uh, in the Ohio Court of Claims by the Cleveland Heights Teacher Union, Local 795, against the Cleveland Heights School District for denying public records access. According to the complaint, in December of 2020, a request was submitted for invoices related to the district's legal fees with Gingo and Bar Law. Unfortunately, this request was denied in February for being too broad. So the teachers union submitted another request in January of 2021, and this time it was more specific. It asked for the invoices from nine specific law firms over a specific three-year period from July 2018 to May 2021. After three months, three months it took, finally in May, just a summary of all the invoices was provided and it showed that the school district had spent a total of nearly $2 million in legal fees. And again, Mr. Gaynor failed to provide any of the actual invoices. So there's no information about the general title of the services, nor the hours or the rates. So later that May, the, the teachers union requested uh, for those specific invoices, submitted another request. Again, Mr. Gaynor issued a denial in June, stating the request still remained overly broad, indicating that records are not kept in one file or location. So I researched this according to the Uniform School Accounting System by the state auditor. There's a specific fund category, the number is 418, where all professional legal services need to be accounted for and retained. Why is Mr. Gaynor unable to locate these invoices if they are properly accounted for in the system? So after continued requests, a few in invoices, not all of them, were provided. However, they were highly redacted. So this is what an invoice looks like. You know no details. All you have is the date and the final amount. We have no idea the rates, the hours you're paying. What are we paying for? There's no information on these redacted invoices. So for over 10 months now, the records requests have not been fulfilled, which has led to the complaint with the Ohio court. In a three year period, $2 million of taxpayer funding has been used and the public has been denied knowledge of what these services are. What is there to hide? I, I ask, I don't know. So if this school board is truly transparent, they will require Mr. Gaynor to release these invoices as requested by the teachers union in compliance with state law regarding redactions. So just to be clear, Appropriate redactions still keep visible the general title of the matter, the dates and services, the hours, the rates, and the total money charged. If you do this, school board, you would really reveal the truth and transparency as you claim. Thank you for your time. Once again, I am here, Mr. Posh, members of the board, Mr. Gaynor. I have two questions. One is, why did this board submit a claim to the Schools of Ohio Risk Sharing Authority for the tune of $34,675, which the Auditor of State said in their management letter was a finding against Mr. Gaynor, the superintendent, and our strategy? Yet, the check, which I have in my hand, a copy of, says it is for the, for the finding, of, finding of recovery for our strategy. Our strategy is one of the insured in a policy that this board is paying. My second question has to do again with transparency. And for the record, I have in my possession a Cleveland Heights police incident dated Report number is 21-0330 for an incident that happened at Heights High School on September 21st, 
around lunchtime in which the officers were called because of a parent was in the building and a brawl came about in which the students were concerned for their safety. If this board is transparent, how come this was not in any of your communication to the community? And I don't have the copy of the report of the gun that was taken about a week ago. If this is what transparency is, Scotty, beam me up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Drake. By the way, there was a meeting last night, two nights ago? Last with, night. Last night with all the parents at the high school, and all those items were discussed with them. So moving on to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve our consent agenda? So motion. Second. Is there any discussion? Um, I have lost access to the consent agenda because my internet hookup is not working anymore. Mark, can you give me that code again? I just I jumped on the, the original one we were on and got back on the public. I mean the private. C3 back to private. Okay. Oh, thank you. You wrote it. Down. All right. Thank you. So I'm assuming nothing has changed since I read it yesterday, but I want to double check. Yes. Okay. Molly, while you're looking at that, I'm going to make a statement about the agenda yes. or the consent agenda. My only concern, and I had to follow up with George about it, was the item about the approval of resolution approving the procurement of uh, design build services. <coughs> This is the work to replace all the air conditioning, HVAC um, management systems, which is the system we have is outdated. You can't get parts for it anymore. So this basically puts it all in one basically master computer system like what we have in the high school. And it links all the other buildings together. So. Yeah, this is that um, system that we've been briefed on it, I think at work sessions, uh, or perhaps it was even in the facilities committee where our, I tell you, our skilled trades folks have done such a great job of extending the useful life of so many of our facilities. Um, and, and they've just begged, scrounged, and bought on eBay, literally, um, controllers for m some of the um, uh, air handlers in our buildings and um, you know and an, another thing that this really does bring up too is you know we lost Taj recently uh, to retirement and um, you know when when he decided to leave it really struck me that uh, the institutional memory of some of our employees as we see Betsy with 38 years of experience giving um, so we're, we're very lucky, but um, what I learned through uh, discussions with Taj and others is just how difficult it has been for them to maintain the current control systems. Um, and so I'm thrilled that we are looking into the, the replacement of that. It will be a much more efficient system. Well, it's also very, it has been very difficult with the current patchwork mm -hmm. um, to implement the changes that we needed to implement because of COVID, because they've, they've had to make tremendous amounts of changes to the controls so that we could reduce the setbacks, increase exterior air, and all the rest of that. Yeah. So and hopefully we've, been, we've been living on borrowed time with those systems. <laughs> hopefully we'll be leaner too because it's been a real skill set finding somebody who could service those old controls whereas well now they're based on a 386 yeah. if you remember what a 386 computer was uh -oh. that's that's what's running yeah. the controls in some of our buildings which is pretty scary okay so that's a big step forward mm -hmm. any other questions thoughts about this mr gainer would you call the roll please mr wright Yes. Mr. Posh? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. 
Moving on to the superintendent's report. All right. Okay, then, uh, could you? Oh, you can't. Okay. Do you, um, can you share yours? Oh, okay, I'll share. Okay. Um, one moment. So I will uh, align my presentation as I have to the past to our goals, and then I'll also um, share some additional information based on the comments um, from this, this uh, evening as well during public comment. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, some of the work that's happened in September aligned to our four goals, um, or four of the five goals in our strategic plan. Um, the first is around our work to improve student achievement this year. We had our first district leadership team meeting. This is a meeting where all of the building leadership team members, the administrators and members of the educational services team come together to begin to talk about um, our academic data and the plans to address our academic data. So you'll see specifically here uh, that we looked at attendance, we looked at enrollment, we continue to discuss our instructional best practices, the district uh, strategic plan in alignment with the building level action plans, and there's a cadence of data review across the DOTs that will continue throughout the school year. We also held elementary grade level team meetings for those teachers in grades K to five. The other grade levels will uh, be coming up throughout the rest of the fall. Specifically during that time, teachers uh, looked at, under the guidance of Bob Swagger, the standards that are getting covered um, this year to make sure that we're addressing our students' needs, especially as we come back from the pandemic last year. So we updated the curriculum at a glance um, documents, received feedback uh, from teachers on those standards, and the plan for instructional best practices. Those standards will be um, part of the assessment that parents will get information about um, for the elementary report card. So we will increase the cadence of feedback parents will receive uh, for a report cards in alignment with the report card cycle for middle school and high school. And Mr. Swagger met with those teachers just to identify those standards that will be the focus of those report cards. Um, as it relates to, first I'm going to start with CTE. Uh, one of the things that the board knows that we're working on is the CTE strategic plan. Um, during the month of September, I met um, with a retired su CTE superintendent who's going to organize some best practice visits so that we can visit some CTE PD consortium sites. Um, and so that, that will be happening this fall. Uh, we also have met with our consultant who is assisting us in uh, working on focus groups for students, staff, parents, teachers around our CTE program. I will be uh, sharing her proposal with the other superintendents in our consortium because we'd like for her to also engage in this process over the course of the year with all of those sites on our journey to uh, becoming a premier uh, consortium site. The plan is to uh, present all of this information, information in a work session that is going to be occurring this spring. Um, so that's on our CTE side. On our post-secondary side, um, you all did meet our National Gear Up Student of the Year, one out of 500,000 students, and I just want to underscore that is a huge accomplishment. Um, but related to Gear Up, um, we were very excited to find out late in September that our district uh, was awarded a $4.4 million grant to, to offer gear up uh, to um, an expanded amount of students over the course of seven years. Um, I'm actually going to reserve some time at an upcoming board meeting so we can hear all the contours of this, and there are definitely some um, members of the wider community that we want to thank for their contribution here. Um, but I want to really um, celebrate Bob Swagger, who, in the midst of four <laughs> academic <laughs> models last year, um, managing my school online and uh, concurrent learning and um, assessments, somehow managed to write this grant and um, 
we were, we were, we were going to receive a huge resource for our students um, over the next uh, five to seven years. And I have to go back to look at the grant. It's $640,000 a year. So I, I just want to say to Bob, who may not be able to hear me, um, so we'll say it again, but thank you for his work. Um, there's lots of details here. We know there are a lot of things to work out, and it is a grant that's really focused on increasing students enrolling in college in particular. So that is um, the focus of the grant, but we'll be able to, to do some intensive middle school focus, starting with students in, in middle school to support that work. So we're excited about that. As it relates to uh, goal three, um, we are in our second year of our family surveys connected to our post-secondary planning survey. And just to remind everyone, our post-secondary planning system is a system that will allow us to identify the assets and the needs of our students, both academically and from a social-emotional perspective, so that we can ensure we are meeting their needs either internally to the district or connecting uh, families with an outside partner. So uh, that survey went out to families just last week, and uh, we will be uh, providing that survey for, um, for staff as well um, a little later in the school year. We also launched the district community learning needs assessment for our, our first uh, community learning center at Noble. Um, and so that assessment is out there, and there will be a series of uh, focus groups um, and surveys to gather feedback through the end of November. Our communications audit did conclude during the month of September. We're in the process right now um, of receiving that feedback from the National School Public Relations Association, analyzing that feedback, that we will use that to identify our communication targets over the next uh, several years. We will uh, be sharing those results uh, during a fall work session. High School Foundation uh, did create a new scholarship in memory of, Wa of Warren Clayman, 54, um, the class of 54. So his friends, classmates, and family have donated in three months over $40,000. We are very thankful to the foundation for um, providing this opportunity, and we're thankful to those colleagues of Mr. Clayman for their contributions to help our students. Um, as you all know, we are doing, uh, we because we're still in the midst of um, the pandemic, the Hall of Fame is going to be virtual, so please mark your calendars for uh, the 16th of October um, for our Alumni Hall of Fame. As it relates to goal four, we had our Grow Your Own informational meeting uh, just last week for those classified staff that are interested in taking advantage of the scholarship so that they can become certified teachers. Uh, five members of our classified staff did attend and will continue to promote this opportunity. And there's a link here uh, from a participant from last year who is now a teacher at Oxford Elementary um, sharing her experience. And so a couple things that I wanted to address as it relates to goal four. Um, and I agree with uh, Karen Rigo. Uh, the substitute crisis is acute. And it is acute in Cleveland Heights University Heights. It is acute in Cuyahoga County, it is acute in the state of Ohio, and it is acute nationally. In anticipation of this, um, we have taken some steps, and actually, you know, subs have always been a challenge, actually, for, you know, for our district and many districts. And I can remember one of the first, one of the first ring meetings that we had this year, um, just about every superintendent was bemoaning how challenging it is, even working with outside vendors who, you know, most districts work with around subs to identify people. Um, so first, as it relates to the suggestion of, of use of staff, we actually do uh, deploy our staff out weekly to assist uh, schools. We are monitoring substitutes and sub fill rates as well. I have substituted in a class myself, and I, like Betsy Race, definitely enjoyed it. Um, but it also helped me to, to see, you know, the challenges there as well. But our Ed Services team that was referenced um, they do go weekly to schools um, to assist and are watching those numbers. We've had instances even last year where there were, um, we had high, high numbers out and kind of have deployment plans in place um, to address that. We also, and you guys have uh, approved this on the consent agenda, both this, this um, month and also last month, we have added building subs uh, to each building at the high school, multiple building subs, so that we have additional staff there to help 
health cover classes. That is something that is new. Um, it's, it's definitely a creative um, approach, um, and I appreciate the fact that this was something that was suggested early by our 795 leadership, and we instantly thought that was a great idea um, and started to work. Also, our principals also requested that, started to work to identify those building subs, but I do want to say, <coughs> Uh, still challenging to identify people. We also have increased our uh, sub pay um, for, from Ren Hill um, to better attract um, people to substitute. <coughs> um, and we actually, we do have um, different members from the different um, uh, represented unions who are, who are subbing. Actually, the state of Ohio, um, in recognition of this crisis, has uh, continued some of the flexibility around substitutes um, across schools in Ohio. So um, they've um, made it a little easier for schools to identify subs because it is so difficult. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be looking to take advantage of that flexibility. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we've been in conversation. These are, are not new issues for, for us because we have had conversations with our uh, union leadership around the subs and sub crisis. That's where, you know, the quest for building subs, that idea came up as well. So, um, you know, we are, we will continue to have those discussions. These are not new discussions. We have been having um, these discussions. Um, and we'll also continue to, to look for uh, creative ways uh, to address this. But I, unfortunately, even new positions that we post, not just substitute teaching positions, almost any position that we post, um, it's very difficult to get uh, people to apply for those positions because it's just a short labor market. Um, and so we'll continue to plan around that. So that's what I wanted to share as it relates to um, the issues around substitutes. Certainly appreciate everyone's work around trying to really figure out um, how to do this. Um, and I'll continue to sub um, as I can because I, I do enjoy it. It helps me to understand uh, some of the challenges that our teachers are facing. Mm -hmm. Especially, I learned a lot about charging laptops. <laughs> oh, how much time is spent charging laptops? Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to address are some of the climate incidents that um, one of our speakers this evening referenced in his comments. And um, just to reiterate what Jim shared, uh, we instantly, um, as those incidents unfolded, one incident we had some um, adults that were trespassing in the building. I talked a bit about that. Um, at the meeting uh, last month, um, uh, the, that was not a, when we hear the term brawl, we think it's, you know, groups of students in a brawl with each other. This was a situation where the police had to quickly and safely remove individuals out of the building because they were not supposed to be there and weren't responding to requests um, for them to leave the building. Um, so that's that situation. We, we spoke, we, we shared that information, talked a bit about that at the meeting yesterday with the high school parents. The second incident involved a student who brought a weapon to school. Um, that was last week. And again, um, during the meeting that we had yesterday uh, with our high school parents, we both walked through that incident and also talked about um, the things that both the district and the high school are doing to address those concerns. We are continuing to get feedback. We shared a communication out with uh, parents, staff, and students also this evening to get additional feedback on those pieces. One thing that I really, uh, really, really want to um, underscore and remind everyone of, we know that our students experienced academic learning loss last year due to the pandemic. What we have also seen is that um, real, our students for sure are struggling with some of the social emotional learning loss as well. Um, and so we have, for example, um, to Betsy's point, um, we're hiring an additional social worker. We've hired um, additional staff, additional teachers at the school to assist us in helping um, students with those needs. It is, um, and it's something that we all have to work together around as a community, not only a community of schools, but also our surrounding community because, you know, oftentimes those issues can be one and the same. Um, I am glad that we've had some initial meetings with Cleveland Heights leadership um, around some ways we can partner to support our students both in the schools but also students and families in the community as they struggle with some really challenging issues, many of which are just related to the hyper stress of coming back from, uh, from a pandemic. 
Um, and so uh, just wanted to really make sure that people are clear on that and uh, clear that these are issues and items that have been discussed and will continue to be discussed as well. Well, there's no question we can't separate what's happening in the larger community from what happens inside the buildings because things flow between the two and everybody is being affected by stress, no question. Um, I have a question though about the building subs. Mm -hmm. How many have we managed to hire? Do you um, know? Yeah, we have um, six, I was actually just trying to confirm, so if you don't mind if I check my text messages. <laughs> okay. Because the audio isn't working, normally I would go to Dr. Lombardo and he, could ha he has the most accurate numbers. Um, So far, we've hired six. Our goal okay. is to hire a total of, I believe it's 13. And is um, that one per building and then? Right. One yeah, per one building for and options. two for the high school. Two for the two high school, school. Okay. yeah. Okay. And those are full-time jobs. Somebody's in the building every day, available every to day sub available wherever to needed Correct. because we can't predict. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Full-time job with benefits. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're a member of the and teacher union. Correct. But remember, that's that doesn't solve the problem. I mean, no. it's a giant step it's in the right direction. It's not sufficient, but it's it, definitely necessary. It's, it's one coverage fourth period. Right. You know, and so it's it, it it it's a it's a big improvement, to be sure, and I certainly am I'm thrilled for it. But it's that that's not going to solve. The we no, still, it's, it it's seems, not sufficient. Yeah, we, we, um, you know, we still need to continue our efforts for marketing and, and thinking, mm -hmm. I think, just as far outside of the box as we possibly can mm -hmm. to um, introduce mm -hmm. members of our community to this way of earning a reasonably good amount of money. Um, you know, substitute teaching is... Um, is a really nice opportunity for some people because it's actually, um, you know, it's seven and a half hours and, and you're finished by 3, 3.30. So uh, for folks who want to be on the same uh, timetable as their kids, that sort of thing, people who work another job in the evening, people, you know, anyway, there's, there's a number of reasons why substitute teaching can really fit in a lot of people's schedules. Um, so I, I, I absolutely uh, agree that the uh, building subs are, are a really good part of the solution, but we also really need to continue to think about ways to do more outreach. And I'm thinking about things like Fall Fest. I see that we're we're doing some hiring outreach at Fall Fest, but I don't see I didn't see on that list substitute teachers, and I also I don't think I saw bus drivers. We actually have a um, every Wednesday a drop-in um, hiring session for substitutes. As oh, that's well. great. I have to mention that. Yeah. Great, great, great. But perhaps we could even add that to what we're doing at Fall Fest. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no reason not to. I yeah, guess. we can certainly bring those uh, to yeah. our our table this Saturday. Yep, that's a good idea. Well, we have all, always sorry, no, um, Rent Hill is um, that's who we outsource. That's who does the hiring for us. Correct. Because I know at one point I may be. Uh, Scott can answer this question. We used to do it in house, correct? Yep, many, many years I ago. I know yes. it was many years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and went away from that because the fill rate was so poor mm -hmm. in terms of, okay. you know, it was a, a massive undertaking to try to recruit your own subs. So I think most districts went to using these kinds of firms like mm -hmm. Renhill or Wixie mm -hmm. um, to mm -hmm. manage that process. Mm -hmm. As it's just, it's really difficult in house to get the number of subs you need, particularly if you have a high number of absences, mm -hmm. um, and get a good fill rate. So, I think the fill rate's been significantly better with these firms since when we did it in house, to your point. And, you know, it used to be that a lot of retirees would take this. Right. Yeah. It was a great opportunity for retirees to work a few days a week, a reasonably short day, and, you know, and, and have something to show for it. But with COVID, Right. They don't yeah. want to. It can yeah. be a death sentence yeah. for, for folks yeah. as they get to retirement age and beyond. I just spoke to a retiree today who 
used to sub yes. in our yeah. middle school. Mm -hmm. And he says he won't do it anymore because mm -hmm. he doesn't feel it's safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can't fault him. No. Well, what about, I mean, I know that there's security clearances that have to go through and all this. Instead of looking at maybe this from the perspective of the, um, the retirees, what about, and I'm not going to say student teachers, but what about recently graduated? Absolutely. Uh, I don't want to say kids anymore, but adults. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, college graduated adults. I mean, they're, they're forced to find jobs in coffee shops. This is right. going to make a lot more money than that. Yeah, we've got a college right. of education that's uh, about half a mile down the street. Mm -hmm. Right. We've got a couple we right seven. within the, yes. the immediate area that, I mean, are we tapping, out, yeah. you know, tapping into them? Is Ren Hill tapping into them? I mean, I think we've got to take this on ourselves because Ren Hill, I'm not casting yeah. any shade on Renhill, but clearly our problem is bigger than they're capable of fulfilling, and so we've got to own some of the solution to it. You know, we'll keep thinking of these creative ideas. I know we just recently started um, listing some of our openings and our weekly updates to parents. Mm -hmm. I think one thing we've also learned um, that, you know, the electronic communication is one thing, but also maybe some, you know, kind of paper take-home communication, kind of, you know, getting out there on your feet, too, as well, thinking about getting you know, the churches or other community right. organizations where people who might not be looking at our <laughs> openings on the yeah. website mm -hmm. uh, but might be interested in doing some of this work too as well as an option. So Yeah, and working we'll with planning. our host cities and with the library as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are other good opportunities yeah. to be yeah. able to get that word out that, you know, we're looking to hire subs. Yeah, and even in putting ads in, you know, Cleveland Jewish News and the Heights Observer mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Yep. It's not terribly expensive, and if we get one or two, that's part of the solution. Yep. Yeah, but it's just not necessarily a sub job. We're hiring a teacher. I mean, that's what, it, <coughs> that's what I'm getting the sense of. I mean, these are our people that we're hiring, not through Ren Hill. That's for the building subs. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, we still need those. Right. We still need those positions filled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, I'm sorry, Dan. Go ahead. No, I was just sort of saying it's, you know, there's triage that we that we need mm -hmm. to do with day-to-day -day subs. Yep. And then certainly there's bigger picture, longer term, uh, you know, building sub. But I think that those could be two different um, person, people. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can be, we should be coy about the ESSER money and how that can be used to pay for some of this. And I know that's where you're mm -hmm. coming up with that's that. What we use, yeah. And, you know, maybe if quick financial analysis, just trying to see if we're expecting a lot more um, absenteeism. We should probably do maybe a five or ten year trend of, te of absenteeism. We can kind of look to see what it's looked like to see if it's very different. That's something we could do. Well, I mean, as, as Dan was saying, you know, you know, manage our own subs. I mean, still yeah. use Ren Hill, yeah. but have internal subs. And I know they end up being jobs with benefits, whereas the sub-jobs are not. Um, but we are sitting on these monies right now. Well, I, what I do want to underscore, we do have, it's not a, a deep pool of money, um, because we do have um, money allocated for things like tutoring. We do have, we did budget for other subs. We budgeted for some additional teacher positions. Um, additional social worker. Um, we're looking at some um, support around some other areas too. So we do have a plan. We want to make sure that as we um, identify how we're using our money that it's also aligned to the plan and the metrics too. I do think it would be good to do, you know, a trend study to see what we're looking looking at as it relates to um, this need in particular. Well, and, yeah, and, and I'd like an idea of just the scope of the problem. Yep. I mean, Looked what is the actual absentee? I know we've seen some for students, and we know that those yep. numbers are skyrocketing. Okay. You know, my, my experience, you know, I don't hide it. I was a breakthrough case mm -hmm. three weeks a month ago, and I was out five days. You know, that's the longest absence I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, I, we got a, you know, 
the announcement today that three of our Heights High staff members, heaven help them, mm -hmm. um, are out, you know, test, you know, tested positive. I don't know what role they play in the building, mm -hmm. but um, certainly our thoughts would be with them, but those are absences and those yeah. are multiple mm -hmm. day absences. Mm -hmm. So certainly to do a study on it is, is a great idea just to get a better handle on the, the scope mm -hmm. of the problem, but in terms of comparing this to previous years, it's yeah, going different. to be different. Yeah. We may be able to kind of identify the to, to a certain extent as possible, some, you know, if there's related to COVID or not, but sometimes it's hard to even see that right. too, yeah. Well, that was gonna be my question. I know um, Karen Rigo had said that there weren't more absences, but I just wondered in, you know, the world of COVID, and, you know, Dan gives the example of if you test positive, you're out five days, <coughs> that's probably more absence not due to anybody's fault, but it's just more absences that mm -hmm. have to be it's covered. It's the nature of the virus. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Yeah. So I guess I would be interested in seeing data on that too, mm -hmm. you know. The number of days. Yeah. And, okay. and where it compares to previous years and not okay. to fault anyone, just saying that because we are dealing with a pandemic and when somebody's out, it's not, I'm out for a day in some cases. Right. It's days per person will be much higher than it was, I'm sure. Right. And, you know, and as we talk about this, we're, we're talking about the adults, but, you know, this is the same virus that's affecting our students and that's right. keeping our students home. And these, lo these extended absences are having a real impact on instruction. You know, that, that, that the, the impact of COVID is very present mm -hmm. still. And so the gaps that we're trying desperately to fill you know it's it's like bailing water out of a out of a boat with a hole in it you know um and and when you think about the impact of five days out on a math class mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know where today's lesson is built on success yesterday mm -hmm. and will help guide tomorrow's lesson and now you remove a student from you know five days you can't pretend that that's not going to impact them for a while. And, that, and so as we continue to build the um, services around our kids, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is going to linger in the educational experience of, of our students mm -hmm. for a long time. And that's why also, as Jim was just saying, these ESSER monies, are so very important and how we spend them mm -hmm. is so very important but we got really clear instruction from the wonderful survey that the team put out mm -hmm. about where the community wants those dollars mm -hmm. spent and it's in helping Academics. our kids mm -hmm. to get back from mm -hmm. this giant educational obstacle Liz, I think uh, I, I think uh, the union rep spoke on it, but uh, but regarding the ancillaries mm -hmm. and their um, participation, possible participation as um, subs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that a possibility? Because we have quite a few that's in the building, and I know you, well, I mean, we talked about that. For, but would that affect, I mean, as far as the, the subs pay is concerned, are they eligible for that or because they're in the union, I mean, is that, a, you know, a conflict of interest or, I mean, is that a possibility? Well, um, I, I'll say that last year we did have an agreement for the ancillaries to sub. Uh, this year it appears that um, there are some potential changes to that um, not initiated uh, by district office, uh, but it's one of the things that we're, we're discussing. Mm -hmm. um, and I will also say that the flexibility that the state has um, provided around um, subs should make ancillary subbing not an obstacle um, as well. So okay. as some of the, uh, I hesitate to, I don't want to really talk too much because I really don't want to um, be inappropriate around uh, conversations we're having uh, with union leadership. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
okay. specifically um, with 795, I don't want to be inappropriate. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that um, we've been in discussion about. It worked well for us last year. Um, and so uh, I believe we'll continue to talk about that. Liz, this is changing the subject a little bit, um, but the, you know, our staff that was vaccinated in our clinic got Pfizer, got the Pfizer vaccine. Mm. So are we encouraging boosters or are we encouraging our staff to go get boosters and what are we doing around that? So we reached out to Giant Eagle to try to coordinate um, a vaccine clinic actually at our school sites. Uh, mm -hmm. To date, we haven't heard back from them. And what I've heard that has happened is every district's doing that. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. Um, and so what they have asked the ESC to do is to help coordinate um, a Saturday clinic. And so they, it wouldn't be what we did last year where you sign up and have an assigned time, but it would just be a really big booster site where people could go um, to get their um, their boosters done so they would sign up on their own it wouldn't be the district coordinating that so mm -hmm. as soon as I get that information I will share that information um, out as well I, you know I know that right now you can't just walk up to a drugstore because my mother called me tonight and told me to make her a booster vaccine appointment for her because she tried to walk into a drugstore. She store. tried to just walk yeah, up to so the drugstore. So there is some level right. of sign up that you have to right. that you have to do um, right. and so if we hear back from Giant Eagle great you know we'll get that going but I do think that they've been inundated and oh, probably sure. a little overwhelmed right now. Well, I, I hope that if this building were available, were appropriate for that, I hope we would offer this building for that giant I mean, we, site. one thing that we talked about from a planning perspective is just to, you know, perhaps have people out of each of our school sites um, who can kind of quickly do it for people that sign up or maybe rotate around the school so teachers don't even have to leave. Mm -hmm. um, That's what teachers we do with and other staff shots. as well, so. Um, we just have to see like how they construction that capacity, but I agree this is a good site. We could just even be an ESC site perhaps on a Saturday, mm -hmm. right? So um, this is closer than Independence. There's <laughs> so, a lot for a lot sure of than for all the neighboring districts. Yeah, for the mm -hmm. neighboring. Districts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have Thank you. Else to discuss with your superintendent report? I do not. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the president's report. Um, we were asked to fill um, a calendar committee. So I need a board member that can fill the calendar committee for this year and also the policy review committee. This was from um, Paul Lombardo. This year being? For this year, probably, to, you know, probably this until the middle of the school year. Yes. I can volunteer for the calendar committee. I can do policy. Um, I don't have really anything else to say, but I would like to thank the teachers' union for coming to us tonight and making the plea that they did. This is a big deal. We need to find a solution for it. And I know it's difficult for them to, to bring four members here in an evening mm -hmm. to present to us. So I'm looking forward to you know, getting the data, Liz, that we discussed mm -hmm. and seeing what we can do about this. Um, moving on, is there any board committee reports? Do we have a we we have a new business item, which is a resolution to join the Ohio uh, Coalition for Equity, and I can't read this word. I just can't see it. Um, thank you, <laughs> uh, Dan. You were going to read this resolution sure. for us, sure, um, and discuss what it's for. Yeah. So this is um, the joinder resolution for our second year of participation in the um, Ohio Coalition for Equity and Advocacy of School Finance and School Funding. Um, this is our participation as a, uh, a plaintiff in the Vouchers Heard Ohio lawsuit. As we all remember, um, Cleveland Heights University Heights was the first school district in the state to join as a plaintiff because of our um, very special position in the voucher catastrophe that the Ohio legislature has inflicted upon us um, repeatedly. And so this um, 
this uh, voucher joiner resolution is the second year's membership and participation in that. Um, and so um, it goes like this. Whereas, the deduction of funds from the school district by the Ohio Department of Education and payment of those funds to private schools, ed, ed choice and voucher funds, diminishes the amount of funding and the levels of educational opportunity for the education of the pupils in the district. And, whereas, the deduction of school voucher funds from the school district further reduces the funding available to support the additional needs of district minority pupils, pupils in poverty, and pupils with disabilities. And, whereas, the deduction of school voucher funds from the school district can result in the involuntary transfer of district local tax revenue approved by the voters of the district for the support of the district's operating expenses to private religious schools for the support of those schools' programs in violation of the rights of the district taxpayers. And, whereas the deduction of school voucher funds from the school district increases reliance on local tax revenue to maintain school operations in violation of the Ohio Constitution and clear directives of the Ohio Supreme Court. Section 1. Now, therefore, the Board of Education finds and determines that the deduction of school voucher funds from the school district is harmful to the district, its pupils, taxpayers, voters, and staff. Section 2. The Board of Education authorizes and directs the school district joinder of the Ohio Coalition for Equity and Adequacy of School Funding, the coalition, and directs the district treasurer to pay coalition dues as set forth in Section 3. Section 3. Coalition dues for the 2021-2022 school year are the sum of $2 per district pupil, enrollment listed on the most, most recent report card, except for ESC boards of education, and dues shall be the sum of uh, 20 cents per pupil, uh, as the average daily membership is the latest report card, or $3,000, whichever is less. Dues shall be allocated by the coalition as follows. One. 50 cents per pupil shall be initially allocated to the payment of coalition operating expenses, and two, $1.50 per pupil shall be allocated to the support of the coalition's efforts in opposition to the deduction of school voucher funds from this and other school districts. Coalition dues are payable upon the passage of this resolution. We were the first district in the state. I will um, inform you all that there are now nearly 90 districts from around the state. If you recall, there are around 611 public school districts in the state of Ohio. So our numbers are growing. Um, there has been just very recently um, announced a new push for what they're calling the backpack bill. Mm. which is uh, Senator Huffman's fantasy um, to basically um, um, allow every student in the state of Ohio to take their school funding with them wherever they wish to go. Um, and, you know, the, the, the real, um, there's a lot of layers of danger to this, but Many of the schools, remember, that are receiving these funds have no transparency whatsoever. They do not undergo anything close to the rigorous weeks-long in-house camping in our facilities, uh, you know, fine-tooth comb study that 
uh, we undergo happily every year. We embrace this every year. Uh, schools receiving these funds go through pretty much none of that stuff. Um, so this is important money. Um, the lawsuit is in its very final stages of preparation, and I suspect that it will be filed within the next very few weeks. We need a second, Dan, you're the... Say again? We need a second. You, know, you read the resolution, you proposed it, we need someone to second this. I, I second. second. <laughs> Go for it. Get in line. <laughs> <laughs> Jody and I both second. All right. Oh, I heard Beverly out there, too. <laughs> Beverly second. The arm wrestle it. <laughs> Scott, you're going to pick who, who said it first. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm in support of this. I'm going to speak first, if you guys don't mind. Uh, I'm in support of this. I had to give a school funding presentation to the Cleveland Heights Democratic Club. There were probably 90 people there last night. And there's just, the voucher deduction has not gone away. No. This year, Shaker's going to receive twice as much state aid, actually a little bit more than twice as much, than we are. Um, they're still deducting $15 million out of our monies. So when you look at the total amount that we get, nine, I, I did, I, just, just looking at our five-year forecast and the, the general fund, 93% of our operating revenues are coming from local resources, our taxpayers, property taxpayers. Only 7% is going toward our kids. That's just not enough, guys. I mean, it, it's going to, I mean, we, we've seen this trend. It's going to go down to zero. Then they're going to be taking our property tax monies away and giving them to kids that are not in our district. And we, we just can't, I mean, it, it was curious in this presentation, a couple of you were there and a couple of you spoke, you know, this is not about taking a voucher away from a family. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with this. This is all about how the how the vouchers are funded. And they have to find a better way to fund it that's not going to cripple the public schools. So, or not. Well, when, when voters in our community vote to approve a levy, they're voting to send some of their real estate taxes to fund the local public school system. If that money is then taken away from the public school system by whatever mechanism, then we are undoing the legitimacy of that vote. Right? If I vote yes. for a levy, then I vote because I want that money to go to a specific yes. thing. Just like when I vote for the uh, library levies or the metro parks levies, those, that's money that I am willing to pay because I want to support something in my community for my common good. Right? And if the state then takes that money away and sends it with something like a backpack bill or through a voucher elsewhere, then the state is undermining the, the power of my vote and the power of every taxpayer's vote in the community. Um, and that's, well, let's see, anti-democratic. We can start there and then the list goes long. Do we have any other comments about this before we vote on it? I think we've all talked about this a lot, and I think we all support it. And I mean, it's it's very disheartening, and it, it's disheartening that you know I, I was disheartened when I joined this board almost four years ago, and it's disheartening to see that we're still here, and um, you know it, it's a fight that we have to just keep fighting. We absolutely cannot give up on it. I really think it's a responsibility that we hold to our taxpayers. Our taxpayers work really hard for the money that they send us, yeah. and they, they send it to us. And for us not to stand in defense of the integrity of their sacrifice wouldn't be right. So, yes. Mr. Gaynor, would you call the roll? Mr. Hunt. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Any unfinished business? Correspondence and announcements? Mm. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I motion we adjourn. I second. Mr. Gaynor, would you call the roll? 
Ms. Serene? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Ray? Yes. Mr. Bosch? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Thank you, for, thank you everybody. Good evening. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.